recording the breakout room sessions. Now I have to accept on my other computer. So welcome everyone. Um, I know most of you it looks like, but I'm Vanessa Frigi. I'm an assistant professor in the Jackson School and um, the chair of our DEI committee, which is why I'm moderating this event. Um, this is an event that we've been discussing a lot in the DEI committee and that has come out of um, some feedback we re received from students. So we're really excited to be able to finally um, host it today and be able to have a conversation between staff, uh, students and faculty around these issues. Um, and our hope is that it'll be as kind of free flowing as possible. Um, we won't be testing you on the reading or anything. So please feel free to um, just share general thoughts, um, even just personal reactions and things like that. Um, and yeah, like I said, we're hoping to to just have it be as much of a back and forth as possible. Um, but having said that, we are gonna start with just a few reflections um, from our esteemed panelists. Um, so to start off, off, us off <laughs> is Professor Angelina Godoy, who's, um, who many of you know, and who will be kind of introducing us to the piece that um, kind of is a jumping off point for our conversation today. So I'll hand things over first to Angelina. Hi, thank you, Vanessa, um, and thanks all for being here. Um, I have to, well, I have to make a confession first, which is that I just came from giving a 90 minute lecture. So if I managed to string together a couple of coherent sentences, then that's an unusual, um, I'll be winning. But um, I am also, give, it gives me a little trepidation also to discuss this uh, or to present this work, I guess, I um, and use it. I'm excited to use it as a jumping off point for discussions. Um, the trepidation only comes from my own recognition that I have so immensely much to learn in terms of um, how to uh, to incorporate DEI as fully as possible into my own teaching. And so um, rather than repeating what's in the article, which is sort of a snapshot into my own learning at one point in my process, I thought maybe I'd just sort of say a few words about what led me to write that piece and, um, you know, <laughs> what where I'm at on this journey. Um, and it's particularly uh, what the ideas that come out in that article that was shared um, are a reflection of an epiphany I had a few years ago, just right before the pandemic, or actually, I guess, in the pandemic. <laughs> it's an epiphany that, that uh, erupted over multiple occasions. But um, very shortly before the pandemic in 2019, I was teaching this class on human rights in Latin America, which I teach every year, and I've taught it every year since I came to UW about 20 years ago. So um, like many of you, I tried to incorporate, you know, current events and things that are relevant to the class. And so that year, one of the things we did early on in the class was we did a Skype call because this was in the days right before the pandemic it was 2019. So I didn't even know about Zoom, um, but we did Skype. Um, and I Skyped in the mother of a political prisoner from Nicaragua. So for those who don't know, Nicaragua is currently under a dictatorship. And in 2018, there was a particular crackdown against dissent, especially dissent on university campuses. And so many young people were um, put in jail as political prisoners and tortured. And we uh, Skyped in one of those young people's mothers. And she spoke to the class just for a short time. It wasn't very long but she became very emotional upon seeing through Skype all of the students arrayed in the classroom. And of course, thinking about her own son and, and the, his peers who had been hauled off to jail for speaking their mind. And here we were in a class on human rights. Um, and so her voice broke and she started to cry. And after that class, she spoke for a short time and you know, I went on to my lecture or whatever. Uh, but after that class, several students came up to me and said, my gosh, what, you know, what could we do for her? Because they had been so moved by hearing her the emotion in her voice and the urgency of her pleas for human rights. And um, the students who came up to me uh, said, so we, there must be something we can do. And I hadn't really prepared to engage with her situation in that way, but the students' urgency and eagerness to help was such that I said, okay, like, let's figure it out. Let's, what we want to meet after class. And, and so we started kind of brainstorming, just what could we do? Like me and this sort of haphazard, you know, ad hoc group of students, I think at the most it was seven or eight. Um, and what we could do in terms of connecting with this woman and other parents of political prisoners in Nicaragua. And what ended up happening was over the course of that quarter, this group of students, again, just an ad hoc group, we would meet after class pretty much every day and uh, talk about what we could do. And they did like a letter writing campaign. They did some events on campus. 
all of this was kind of ancillary to the class as as a class it was just an interest that came from the students and i remember asking them sort of what you know what gave you the initiative to to engage with the class materials in this way and i remember one of the students said well is that she sounded like my abuelita um and I realized it was very significant for Spanish speaking students that they heard her speaking and speaking from deeply from the heart in a very personal way in Spanish. Um, and that they related to her story in a in a very different way. Um, it was majority Latinx students of color who came to me and who formed this group about Nicaragua, although none of them were Nicaraguan themselves or of Nicaraguan descent. Um, so I had got to know those students really well. And then um, about halfway through the class, you know, I gave a midterm. And as uh, all of us know, sometimes our tests are harder than others. And this time, I think I gave a hard midterm. And many of the students were disappointed with their grade. The students in the class as a whole were disappointed with their grades. And so I decided to give students an opportunity to rewrite the midterm. It was a take home essay. Um, if they first attended a workshop with me, where I'd kind of go over what I had been looking for and kind of give them a chance then to retake the test. So I did that, and when I had the workshop for students who wanted to redo their midterm, and I only gave that opportunity to students who got um, at the lower end of the grade scale, and when I uh, had that workshop, I was really surprised to see the students stream into the room for the workshop and realize that many of the students in this group were had, had therefore scored at the lower end of the grading scale. And I realized well, these students are tremendously engaged in the class. They're more engaged in the class than most students. These are students who have been meeting with me every week after class to talk about all this stuff. And yet they're, you know, they're, it, it, so I could no longer see the grade as reflective of like a lack of interest or engagement with the class. And I thought, you know, what's going on here? And so I started talking to those students about their experience in the class and particularly their experience as Latinx students in a class talking about human rights in Latin America, in which oftentimes it would be there would be more vocal participation from non Latinx students who would offer anecdotes about maybe a you know spring break trip that they had taken or a, or a church service trip. Um, but students that had this deep wealth of familial experience and background um, oftentimes were quieter in class. And as I started to work with them and kind of unpack those things to understand for myself, I started realizing I really needed to rethink my entire pedagogy. And I'm still on that path today. Um, the interviews that were in the uh, in the article are interviews that I did a year later. So when I decided it was early in the pandemic and I thought, um, <clears throat> excuse me, now would be a good time to have in-depth conversations with students over Zoom, particularly in the context of the, uh, you know, the uprisings after the killing of George Floyd. And really what ended up being so powerful for me was the students' own words, and that's what I hope come out clearly in the article if you've had a chance to read it. The wisdom, if it conveys any uh, in that article, is the students and the education that they gave me. And um, that they continue to give me because I'm now rethinking all of my pedagogy in different ways. So maybe that's where I would leave it here. I guess I would just say by way of summary, um, one of the things I took away from both those encounters with the students who were doing the Nicaragua project and yet, uh, and then the students who I interviewed um, in the summer of 2020 was that ways of talking about justice, um, I had always assumed that talking about injustices was itself a key to resolving those injustices, right? I teach about human rights. So it's all about trying to find solutions to urgent problems that are plaguing real people. Um, but what I learned from this was that talking about injustices not only doesn't necessarily take you towards solving those injustices, but it actually can cause actual harm. Like, so I started thinking about this in terms of first do no harm. Um, to students who come from backgrounds where they've experienced some of those injustices or their families have. And that I think has made me realize I need to do my job a lot better and I'm still struggling to do that. But um, I'm eager to learn from all of you and the thoughts that you bring to the conversation and I'll leave it there. Thanks so much, Angelina. Um, so I wanna turn now to actually a student um, who's going to kind of give some reactions and reflections on Angelina's piece. This is. Um, Rhiannon Rassertenum, and uh, she's a DEI student fellow um, on the committee and a JSIS senior. So I'll hand things over to you, Rhiannon. Thank you, Vanessa. Hi, everyone. Um, uh, yes, I'm a senior this year. I'm in the Jackson School. I've taken, I feel like, my fair share of uh, Jackson School classes, and overall, it's been a really positive experience. But just in my um, initial reactions to the 
article that Professor Godoy wrote, um, it was, I think, very reflective of my own experiences, um, not in the specific situations, but uh, just, you know, those personal reactions and the uh, feelings in the classroom. Um, I feel like when I was reading the direct quotes from some of the students, I even started tearing up because um, I think one thing that Professor Godoy mentioned was the feeling of like isolation that students felt. And so in a way it was so um, almost relieving to see or confirm that other students do have those same feelings that I do in the classroom. Um, and so it's not just isolation um, from like, you know, the other peers of in whatever classes we're taking, but also just the idea that um, whatever our reactions to or feelings are in the classroom, that it's um, only us. And so I really enjoyed the article just in the sense that it kind of validated um, what I had felt sometimes in classrooms and just knowing that um, it can be unfortunately a common experience for other students. So um, I just wanted to speak to that part. I'm sure you believed the article when you read it, but here I am as another student just to um, confirm that further. Um, but past that, I think, um, you know, something to think about as we're going into the breakout rooms um, is just all the different ways that um, I think how important it is one for the professors to even just have this context and knowledge going into their classroom. Like the change doesn't have to be implemented right away or um, the you know syllabi don't need to have those. There's not like a to-do list of ch changes to make, but I think the most, um, the biggest step and what I think some of the students echoed in their own interviews was just a demonstration from the professor that they were aware of the um, their own positionality in the classroom and they were aware that you know some subjects might be more personal to students and that they weren't always the expert in those areas but personal experience would um, was also a very important factor um, and I think when professors and faculty set the class with that tone um, then that provides a really good foundation then for students to feel more comfortable maybe not speaking up right away in the classroom but knowing that they could reach out to the professor afterwards or they feel more welcome to um, voice any concerns or engage more with their peers. Um, and so uh, I think just everything that the students had, I really resonated with. Um, and I thought it was really cool that a professor, I know you're all very busy, but to take that extra time um, to really invest in students because it, I feel like does have huge impacts for the, years and years of teaching to come. Thanks so much, Rhiannon. And thank you so much for all the contributions you've made to these discussions and your investment as well. Um, so I wanna turn things over uh, to Tony Lucero now, who um, most of you already know, but is a professor in the Jackson School and chair of our Latin American and Caribbean Studies Department, and I believe soon to be chair of CHID. Okay, but over. Thank you so much, uh, Vanessa. And thank you, Rihanna and Angelina for, uh, uh, for this wonderful conversation. Um, uh, before I start, I, I do want to acknowledge that even though we're in a virtual space again, we are on the, many of us are on the traditional homelands of the Coast Salish people, uh, the homelands and waters of the Suquamish, Duwamish, Tulalip, and Muckleshoot peoples. And, and this acknowledgement I, I know is in many of our syllabi and is the beginning of many of our meetings. But I like it so much because it's it's just an invitation to think about the relationships that we have, should have, and I'll sometimes forget about. And I think this is one of the things that I really appreciate about this conversation, thinking about and with our students. And Rhiannon and others, I think, are, are to be thanked for this conversation at all, because this really does come from students. Like this, the DEI committee really beautifully, led by Vanessa, has really channeled the student uh, desire to have a more intergenerational conversation about what we're doing. And uh, and just to echo what Rhiannon said a second ago, this is not a how-to guide. You know, we're not going to give you any bullet points about what you should do, you know, uh, in your syllabus next quarter. But it's just a moment to reflect with a really beautiful piece. And Angelina, I really, this is a gift and I really want to thank you for it. I really love this article. 
And I, I just want to say a few things about it. I'll be very brief because I think we all want to spend some time in conversation in relationship with each other and think about what this opens up for us. What are things that we can do uh, maybe differently as we go forward? But the first thing that I just wanted to kind of just name is how uh, Angelina, in, in both her remarks and in the uh, piece, really models a wonderful balance of erudition and humility. There is so much deep learning that this piece has, and it wears its learning very lightly, but it does it in conversation with uh, the acknowledgement that Angelina doesn't have the answers, right? That it's very much, you know, Angelina quite literally gives the students the last word on this topic. And I think that was beautifully done and it was quite intentional, but it, I think it, it also helps us think that we learn so much when we just pause for a second and ask students, not only what they think, recall, or identify from the reading, but how they feel about it. Like, what are these things that, you know, where does this hit you? Um, how does it hit you differently, as one of the students who Angelina talked to said? What, what does this say to you? And, and that's really the second, you know, kind of big takeaway I, I, brought, I take from the piece is that it invites us to think about the classroom as a place where people can be a little bit more vulnerable, um, where they can actually share some doubts and uncertainties, anxieties, and hopes, you know, uh, and in a way that's kind of provisional. And I think that's really important. When we ask students to share a, a feeling that doesn't have to be fully formed or justified or defended, I think that really opens up a really uh, beautiful way to, um, to invite others to come to, to, to a learning environment. So I really, I really did appreciate that a lot. And I think that when we ask students to bring more of their whole selves into the classroom, and we do the same and meet them sort of halfway, we can, um, we can create different opportunities for building those kind of relationships that I think are always there. We, they're always there. Those relationships are always there. And, um, and I think what we're trying to do is to make them as horizontal as possible. Uh, but one student who, uh, who I was interviewing for a program, a summer program once, and I, and I started the conversation with that kind of hope, that I hope this could be a very horizontal conversation. And she, she checked me and said that whenever someone says that, it's a real indication that the space is already not horizontal, right? That somebody's really calling the shots and somebody, and that, that was absolutely true. And I think that's still true. The, the university in the classroom is still a very uneven place. And, and I think we should be clear about that. And we wanna help students think through that and think about that and think with us about how we can do things a little bit differently. Um, but just to say one more thing about how to do that and, and just to share maybe just one thing, one idea that I've recently started doing in my classes is I really thought about silence a lot in the past um, because as a college student, I didn't talk a whole lot. I was totally intimidated by um, most of my peers my first year of college. And um, I remember when uh, someone noticed that I had something to say, you know, it wasn't actually even class, it was like in, in, a, in a response or something, but just the acknowledgement that I had something to say was incredibly meaningful to me. But since that, I've always tried not to pathologize silence and not to really give more points for, you know, the, 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 the squeaky wheel of the students participating all the time. So when even all of us, I think, think participation is important, but on my syllabus, I don't call it participation anymore, or at least I try not to. I really talk about contributing to a learning environment, which means either speaking or also trying to figure out when you shouldn't speak. When are the times where you can actually try to create some conversation space for other people and being intentional about how we're all doing that sometimes. That I find, and inviting students uh, to think with us about how to do that. So those are some things that really, um, Kind of came up for me in, in reading uh, Angelina and also just the, the references really are fantastic. There's so many things I think it's going to send you to the library like it's sending me to the library, but I really love the, the quote that Angelina uh, picks from Roderick Ferguson's book about the importance of these little things, be they syllabi, job ads, recruitment strategies, memos, books, artwork, or protest. I love all these things that they can be small ways to make our a very non-utopian university space into a, a space of possibility. Um, and I also just want to end by saying uh, how happy I am that Daniel Asale is here, who is our new faculty member, and also uh, uh, has a tremendous uh, background in critical university studies. So I'm just really happy that she can be part of these conversations as we're going uh, forward. And, and then you also get bonus points for coming to a meeting before you're even on our payroll. So that is duly noted. That's it for me. Thank you, Tony. And yes, uh, welcome, Danya, to uh, an early uh, early meeting for, for you here. One of many, don't worry. Um, 
So now to kind of break the ice, we're going to send you into breakout rooms just for a quick 10 minutes, um, just to get people talking, and then we'll come back and have kind of reflection together. But um, the goal initially is uh, just to tell us kind of, or whoever is in your room, like where you're coming to um, in these conversations, whether it's, you know, the courses you're teaching now or um, your engagement with the classroom, whatever it may look like at this point. Um, so it'll be about four to five of you in each room and uh, in 10 minutes or so, I'll bring you all back. <laughs> 